I look in focus? <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today, we're going to be recreating another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today, we're going to be looking at really one of my very, very favorite artists of all time. Today, we're going to be looking at the work of George Bellows and this painting, Dempsey and Furpo, 1924, in the collection of the Whitney Museum in New York City, believed to be, or considered to be probably the single greatest sports painting ever made. Um, probably his most famous painting as well, even though he did a lot of different stuff, and only he painted about like 10 boxing themed paintings, but this is certainly the series for which he's most remembered. Um, even though probably he did a lot more seascapes than anything else, but that's a whole other conversation. We're going to get into it. We're going to get into the painting, the history behind it, the history of the artist. I'll let you know that there is an outline for today's painting. It's going to greatly simplify your life if you follow the outline, if you trace the outline. I'm going to show you how to do that. It is a little bit of a time-consuming outline, so I've pre-recorded it. I'm going to play it, skip through, because it's pretty straightforward of how to tra trace something. And I'll let you know how to find that <coughs> outline! Oh my goodness. That was a sneeze, sorry. Um, there's a Dropbox link in the description below here. And these are all paintings that we've already done. And many of these folders contain more than one painting. Some of them are five or six paintings in here. You can see we just keep on going down. All of the greatest artists in human history. So far, there's still lots more to go. Um, here we go. We see three, fold, three files within this subfolder. There's the original and then two versions of the outline. One's a JPEG, one's a PDF. And this is taking a second to reload. We will talk about George Bellow's biography here in a moment. Um, probably, if you haven't heard of George Bellows, it wouldn't surprise me. He died relatively young at age 42, which is young for many artists. We'll talk about uh, why that happened here in a moment. But uh, I think that, that contributed greatly to him not being as famous as probably he really should be. So here's a Facebook group that I encourage you to join. Upload your version of each painting that we do, as well as artwork you're working on in your own time here. Heidi's version, awesome, I love this. Sangyu was an artist that we looked at, I guess maybe a month ago now. And looks like Heidi's doing an initial painting inspired by him. Cool. This is a painting we did just the other day. And we can keep on going. Wow, that looks great, Eleanor. Wow. So you can see there's people of all different levels of ability here. Some people who've been painting with me just for literally a few hours or a couple of days. And people who've been painting for years. And it's a great place to, to join a community of people who are on their own creative journey at different places. You can upload your work and get great feedback from, uh, from this great community. Okay, so how are we going to make this painting here? We're going to take this outline. I'm going to show you how to transfer the outline onto a canvas. So I'm going to play this video and talk over top of it while it's playing here. So you can see there's some of the tools. I'm gonna to need a ruler, some a canvas. This canvas is a nine by 12 sized canvas. You can use any size you like if you wanna scale up your the outline or scale it down on your photocopier or printer at home. And uh, you can also print the outline out on any type of paper, uh, photocopy paper. You can use inkjet printer, laser jet printer, photocopier, whatever you want to use. And then I, you see I'm taping it down onto the canvas. Now there are a bunch of lines on here that uh, I'm going to use a ruler to, uh, to help me draw some of those lines. And you can see I'm also just going to 
do a little bit here to make sure that line is as straight as it can be. So it just needs a little adjustment here. And then I think that should be good enough for government work, as my grandfather always used to say. Boom. Okay. You also notice I, I rotated the canvas because I was this little bit at the bottom. Often those things are less noticeable on the bottom of a painting than they are at the top of a painting. So that's why I just moved it there. And it's it's going to disappear by the end of today's painting, but if you're curious, like, why did he do that? That's strange. So I'm going to use carbon paper. Carbon paper, you can use graphite paper as well. And you can, should be able to get it from your local art supply store or art uh, Amazon. There's a link to the Amazon description in the, below. As well as fabric stores will also sell carbon or graphite paper to transfer patterns. As I said, this one takes a little bit of time, so it's worth just uh, you know taking your time. I don't do all of the outlines on all of the little details on the faces because all of it's going to get covered with paint. So I really this is only just mostly for reference to help me. And you don't want to become a slave to the to the outline, otherwise it's just going to drive you absolutely nuts. The camera, I don't think, did I, oh yeah, I did do some of those figures in the background. I do a little double check, is everything in there, did I miss anything? Oh, a little hand. That's good enough, right? You obviously want to make sure before you peel that uh, tape off that you've done a pretty good job making sure that the outline is all there. Otherwise, you might uh, be like, oh, I forgot to do this guy's head. Uh, and then you're trying to line this up. It'll never happen. So you want to make sure it's there. I'm going to save this outline in case I need it. There's, you just the other day, you saw how I can use it again if need be at some particular point in time. So, I'm going to do what I pretty much always do these days for the past couple of years, which is I'm going to put down a coat of warm yellow onto this canvas. I would be, I, I'm 99% I'm positive that he would have used, in fact, let's just take a quick moment to look at this painting, because I'm sure some people are like, that's crazy, you put, we're going to put yellow on this painting right off the top? Well, most artists would apply some sort of ground, a colored ground, onto the painting. And traditionally they would use something like a warm brown. Um, I don't really see anything here. I mean, actually, I... I now that I look at it, I, it looks a little bit like he may have actually used a white canvas. Maybe. I don't know if that's white he's... Maybe that's just white he's applying on there. It's hard to... What I'm looking for is like the edges and where different colors run up against one another and trying to see... Sometimes there's little gaps in between those areas. So I don't know if that's a color, a, a white that he painted in there, or if that's a bit of the canvas showing through. If he did, that's kind of surprising to me. Because... And this looks like there could be... There could be white underneath here. But I honestly think painting that yellow is actually going to save us some time over... Um, just painting on the white canvas itself. So I'm going to do what I normally do. And today, this painting is going to be a little bit of a time consuming painting. So, you know, I, I'm fully expecting to be here for about four hours today painting away. You're certainly welcome to watch the whole thing. And I can also imagine some people tuning in and tuning out skipping right to the end if you're not watching this while I've painted it live. I know that some people like watching the full video because they get to see sort of me deal with the inevitable struggles 
and quote unquote mistakes that happen along the way because every painting is like a small journey every painting is like climbing a mountain right and nothing ever goes entirely according to plan right i mean yeah i'm sure there's probably you know in the guinness book of world records there's someone who made a painting that turned out exactly the way they wanted it to from the first brush stroke to the last brush stroke. I'm, sh I'm sure there's, in, in the billions of paintings that have been created in human history, I'm sure there's a couple of paintings that um, someone could cite that unfolded exactly as planned, as exactly as the artist envisioned. It's possible. Does it happen all the time? No. Do do the great artists from art history do they do they get to a point where they're making perfect paintings all the time? No. Do people assume that great artists never struggled? Yeah, generally I think so, which is why a lot of beginner artists get really frustrated with their work and they're like, "Ugh, it's not turning out. Uh, I don't know what I've done. I must be I should just stop painting i'm not good at painting let's just maybe violin i should maybe i should try maybe oh, it's tough it's expensive what about tennis should i try tennis lessons no Ugh. well obviously i'm not good at painting so I, let's just try something completely different let's let's try hang gliding and i know it sounds ridiculous to say all that but <laughs> as a teacher myself I have seen, I've had these conversations with people. I've literally had conversations like that at when I've been in parties. Remember when that used to happen? Remember when you used to go to somebody's house and have a conversation face to face with the, with a stranger? Uh, and I used to, and, and people would say, oh yeah, I tried painting once and I just, I wasn't good at it. I, I just, you know, I'm not very, I just had to give up. I had a few, you know, I just, the, the, it just wasn't working out, so I just uh, I gave up. And I'm like, oh wow, that's that's terrible. And <laughs> I just think about you know we have a two year old daughter, and she's trying to learn how to do all sorts of things, and she's falling, and there's some tears as she's learning to to do many things for the first time, and. You know, it's, you can't just, you know, when you're trying to learn how to walk, you know, you just, you know, oh, it just turns out perfectly the first time and you never fell down. Most of us fell down many times. We just don't remember how difficult it was those first uh, few years of our lives, which is why probably biology has kind of erased those memories from us, right? We don't remember much from our early youth. Because so much of our youth is 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 very frustrating, and involves lots of falling down and getting up, and um, so painting is the same way. There's going to be lots of falling down, and I fall down when I'm painting all the time. So. As they say, it's not how many times you fall down, but it's how many times you get back up, right? So, uh, I've got my paints on the palette. Uh, if you're curious as to what colors I'm using here, all of that is in the description below. Um, you don't have to use the same brand of paint that I use. I Probably very few people who are painting with me actually use this brand you every brand of paint makes the colors that I'm using they're probably named a little bit different and, and I did a video showing you know the, the basic combinations of colors from all of the major paint brands so you can just watch that video it's in the description below um, and usually every brand of paint we they usually make a few tubes or 
buckets or jars of larger um, quantities of, of select few paints, they're always the ones that fit in, in what we call here a split primary palette because they're the most useful color. So if you're ever looking at the art supply store and you see that there's that one, you know, have a whole bunch of little tubes and there's the one of the bigger tubes, right? That these, that's generally where you should look for these colors. Anyway, um, so let's put this painting here to dry. We got everything set up and ready to go. So let's talk a little bit about who George Bellows was, why we're making a painting of boxing on today. <laughs> well, today is Boxing Day here in Canada. Boxing Day is a, usually the, the biggest shopping day of the year, really until Black Friday and Cyber Monday, kind of, which are American traditions sort of took over and are taking over the world. Um, but traditionally in Canada, the biggest sales of the year are on Boxing Day, right? As all the, the stores try to get rid of all their extra Christmas stock. So it seemed to me kind of appropriate to do a painting about boxing, but instead of opening boxing up presents and, and, and goods on stores, I thought this is the most famous painting um, boxing painting that I could think of when I thought of a word boxing. Um, this painting, as I said, is at the uh, the Whitney Museum, and it's it was there the day the Whitney Museum opened in 1931, um, and it's really one of the most popular paintings in their collection. So let's just look at the size: 51 inches by 63 inches, or 130 centimeters by 160 centimeters. So it gives you an idea. I mean, I've seen this painting a number of times in person, but it's, you know, a, a, just over a meter, so it, it's a it's a good sized painting. So when we're thinking of of ours, this little painting you could probably fit, I don't know, maybe ten of these inside that painting. So there's a lot of detail in our painting today. We're not going to get all of it in. I'm I'm probably going to even eliminate some of the figures, especially the characters in the background. Right, all these little figures there, they're going to disappear. Parts of people's faces, or everything's going to get simplified here. So let's talk about George Bellows. Born in 1882, dies in 1925 at the age of 42. And which is, was a shock to everyone. He died of um, a ruptured appendix. Something, which is, it's, you know, a serious condition. But in these days today, would be a very relatively simple operation uh, emergency operation to get fixed assuming you're in a metropolitan area you can get in an ambulance you'll probably be home later that day or or the, a couple days later from the hospital right back in 1925 um, that was a, you know a, a little bit more of a serious procedure so um, he's born in Columbus Ohio and his parents were much older, so his mom was 40, his dad was 50, so that was pretty uncommon today. I mean, or then, it's still kind of uncommon. We, ha we actually have a friend who's uh, a little bit older who had a child recently, but um, it's, you know, so that would have been probably a bit of a surprise to the family. He had a sister who was 18 years older than him um, when he was born. His mother's side of the family, his maternal grandfather was a sailor or fisherman. So he spent a lot of time in Sag Harbor, Long Island, which is uh, you know a big kind of fishing area there. If you've if you've uh, if you're a hockey fan and you know the 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 New York Islanders hockey team, one of their famous uh, infamous logos is the fisherman logo, um, and. Uh, so, and eventually the, the family moved, or he moved to New York City to pursue his art education. Because he was always drawing as a child. He, he was drawing before he even went to kindergarten. And, you know, the family, or at school, he would be asked to decorate the, the classrooms and draw on, the, on the, the chalkboard and all that kind of stuff. 
Simultaneous to his interest in art, he was very interested in sports as well, and he got a scholarship to attend Ohio State University uh, in 1901 as, on a, as a baseball scholarship. And he was also into basketball as well. Basketball would have been a fairly new sport at the time. And he played on both teams while he was in university, and he was also uh, studying illustration and design while he's there. And he, he did a number of things like do drawings for the, the school yearbook, etc. Um, and so after, after he graduated, he goes to New York and becomes a student of Robert Henry. And we've talked about Henry a number of times. Um, he also, I mean, Robert Henry was, I've got to do a painting by Henry because he, was also probably one of the most influential art teachers in American history in the sense that he is at the sort of the nexus of so many different American artists of that period of time from the early 1900s or like 1920s almost everyone New York artist that the who's who passed through his classroom including artists that we painted recently Henry Asawa Tanner we did for American Thanksgiving who did we do just recently? Oh, Stuart Davis. Um, and some artists painted in Henry's style, which was this kind of representational uh, type of work. And then some artists like Stuart Davis did the big, pretty much the exact opposite. And, and Henry is famous for forming a group called The Eight and is seen as the figurehead of what was called the Ashcan School. Now, the Ashcan School was not an actual building located anywhere with a registrar and all that. It was, it, it, you know, sort of similar to, like, the Hudson River School, which was another group of artists. It was like a, 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 a movement of, of artists that gathered together um, and uh, were... I mean, the, the term even Ashcan is a little bit of, uh, of a pejorative term, as a lot of like art movements, Cubism, Fauvism, uh, were were often terms that were that, that were invented by critics to deride and ridicule the, these groups of artists. The Ashcan School is is no different. The, this idea, the Ashcan School, comes out of this idea that the paintings tended to be kind of dark gritty, grimy, the colors were generally, you know, lots of browns and blacks and grays and muted uh, tones, you know, gray mixed into all of the colors. And so the idea is that, like, the colors were, like, were they're, they're mixed with ashes from, like, uh, cans and, uh, you know, people put their cigar, you know, uh, out into, like, ashtrays kind of thing, right? So it was, but I think those artists were like, ah, kind of like that. Because a lot of the Ashcan and the Eight paintings were of urban cityscape images of, of as we'll see here in a, in a short bit when we look at uh, Bellows's paintings, they're, they're paintings that take place in cities. And there's a lot of domestic scenes within apartments and houses in the city children playing in the street here like we see with the cliff dwellers um, rather than paintings pastoral scenes of um, uh, beautiful countryside landscapes uh, you know if you think about like the Ashcan school a lot of those paintings are from like 19 late 1800s to 1920 kind of thing the and we think of what was happening in Canada around that same time as the birth of, uh, I mean, the group of seven didn't form until like 19, 1919 or 1921, I can't remember. But the the Canadian artists decided to focus on the, the you know, painting in Algonquin Park, in provincial parks, mountains. There's, there's very rarely any people whatsoever in those paintings versus the American artists at this particular point in time are painting urban scenes, right? Um, let me see. 
what do I want, else do I want to mention? I think it's 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 also interesting that uh, George Bellows was very politically active. He was interested in anarchism and and far left movements, and he he wrote articles. He uh, you can see he was on the editorial board of a socialist journal, The Masses, and. Uh, and yet he often came to loggerheads with the the other people who worked at the paper uh, because of his illustrations and drawings and he was he was like very adamant about the the rights of artists to express and say whatever they want and he didn't like other people saying no no you, I actually can you just change that uh, background there it would be great if you inserted uh, a little old man trying to cross, and he'd be like, are you kidding me? This is a drawing I did. This is what's going in the paper. And if you don't like it, I quit, right? Which is, he does. Another similar story is, um, I think this is kind of recounted kind of similarly here, is that he was doing illustrations and paintings depicting some of the, the horrific conditions that news was filtering back from soldiers returning from World War One, and he was illustrating some of those stories for newspapers and people were saying like "Who? what does this guy know? He's never been there he's never gone, he's never why, like what right does he have to illustrate these supposed things that happened in the trenches in World War One? and his response which I think is genius is to say oh I, I don't remember was Leonardo da Vinci there to witness uh, Jesus' Last Supper? Gosh, I I seem to remember that he made that painting about 1,500 years after that happened. I guess, I, hmm, I guess we should probably burn the Last Supper because Leonardo wasn't there. He's, he has no right to make that painting. I think that's, it's, that's a great response that's an all-time genius comeback to, to a criticism that's like the artist's version of of a, of a stand-up comedian dealing with a heckler <laughs> right <laughs> I was reading that I was like I'm, I'm saving that and putting that in my back pocket um, what else do I want to say here uh, you know as as he's after he has a family he has a wife and two daughters. He, he makes a lot of paintings of them, um, often in the house in these domestic scenes, which is kind of interesting because that is something that is a little bit less common for male artists, really even up until today. A lot of male artists are trying to do these very masculine things, painting cars and airplanes and war and... and, and um, and then you've often seen female artists who are painting the more domestic scenes, often because, especially historically, they weren't allowed to work or they had to stay home, they weren't allowed to leave the house, all these different kinds of um, absurdities. But here we have Bellows making a point of painting his family and some of the things, you know, the simple moments in life um, amongst, inside the house, which I think is, again, makes... I think him uh, a really progressive artist, and obviously he had very progressive politics as well. So in some ways, it's not surprising. Uh, what else? Oh, he's big into lithography. Um, one of the things I wasn't able does there mention of it in here? I don't know. I haven't read the this Wikipedia page, but one of the things. Um, when, yeah, this is. I was trying to do a little bit of research into this to see if I could find because I didn't even realize that he illustrated some of H.G. Wells' most famous books. Right, the H.G. Wells did the Time Machine, and um, did he do the Journey to the Center of the Earth? I'm sure some people will remember here in the in the chat. So let's just take a look at uh, some of his paintings here. Now he made thousands of paintings. Wiki art here only has, I think, 28 of them. But, um, you know, we could just see, you could see the kind of the influence of the Ashcan group here. These paintings that are, 
you know, nighttime paintings, paintings that occur in like um, shadow. Uh, he did a lot of these winter scenes, and he, you see like protests. We see people like uh, gathering outside. This kind of thing is the kind of thing that you would have seen maybe as illustrations in newspapers. So in I, in in some ways like. George Bellows uh, is a proto-pop artist in the sense that he's painting things that that are kind of low art, uh, that are not considered to be worthy subject matter of true capital A art, right? You know, the the lower classes, the lower middle classes, children who who don't whose families don't have money to go dress up in in their their Sunday whites and go out to the countryside and uh, have picnics, but are playing with the fire hydrants in the city, right? Um, as we saw, actually, I just kind of skipped over. So he did some of these boxing paintings in 1909, 1910. Did a bunch of series of these here. And these are like these amateur boxing fights. And he, again, he was big into sports when he was younger. He made a decision to go into art, however. But um, he returns to that subject matter for today's painting, which is one of the very last paintings that he did before he died. Uh, we'll talk about who Dempsey and Firpo were and why this match is kind of famous. It's a famous boxing match anyway. Um, but uh, let's get... We'll, we'll save... I'll save that as we, we talk about that. I think there's... I mean, there's a Wikipedia... All of these links are in the description below as well. I put all that in there. So I think let's let's get into the painting here, because it's going to take us some time. So it looks like everything's nice and dry. Okay, so let's just look at the original here. Uh, and think about... Hmm. Well, I think what I'm going to do is paint a bunch of black outlines right now in order to help me and to speed up this entire process. So, I don't usually do this, and if I was painting it on my own, I would just go right into painting all of the, the figures... But I know that for a lot of people, that's it's pretty difficult just to kind of launch right into a painting like that. So I'm going to paint the outlines. Uh, yeah, so let's... I'm going to mix this up by taking some cool blue and cool red. Oops. Let's look at this here. This color, it doesn't have to be... Like I'm mix, I'm gonna mix basically my a black here, and it doesn't have to be a perfect mix. Like this would probably be a little bit more on the purple side. I mean, I, let's well, it doesn't have to be on the purple side. We'll just add a little bit more yellow in there, and it goes very very dark. It becomes essentially a gray, a very super dark gray. And I u mix this color, which is cool blue, warm red, and cool yellow, to create this because essentially. What we're looking at here is, if we mix cool yellow and cool blue together, we get a, a very deep, uh, or not deep, a very saturated green, our most intense lime yellow green. On the opposite side of the color wheel is red, our warm red. We mix that together, because they're exactly opposite, they cancel each other out inside the, what we call the neutral core. <laughs> So now we've got it basically as close to a black as we can make here with this limited palette. Now, I, th I don't even think I'm going to use black in today's painting. I think we can get away with it without it. Even though when you look at this painting and say, wow, we're going to use a lot of black in here. You could use black and I could see possibly adding black maybe into some of the figures in the foreground, some of the darkest areas. But um, I think what 
and because you know i if i do add black i'd probably not want to put it in the background here which is probably where most people would say well that's exactly where it's going to go i mean you could put black but i wouldn't put it straight on the painting i would mix it with other colors and make it a bit more of a gray anyway which is basically what we've mixed here because otherwise it's going to appear to come in front of all these figures black is such a dominant color that it advances and sometimes sits right on the surface. If you think of a of a of a painting as a um, as a window, it black would act like frost on the window. It is right there, right up on the on the front, right. So you always want to be careful. If you're going to use black, it goes right in the foreground, right. So that's why I, if I was using black in any way in its purest form, it might be on some of the hair here. And jackets and shadows otherwise that would be the only places I would put it in here okay long story short let's get to this painting I've mixed up my black here now I did all these outlines so I'm not gonna sit here and outline all afternoon I just want to kind of go over some of the big shapes so that when I paint other colors over top of them, I don't lose these outlines. I still have the basic form. Now, again, if I was doing this on my own, probably what I would be doing right now would be painting this area around here first, and then I would just put big blobs of paint on these faces, Um, like the skin tone for the faces and you can see I'm not at all concerned about like how clean or pretty this looks because all of this is just gonna get covered up but it will help me see where everything uh, is So this, this will also, you know, some, you might think, unless you do this really, really precisely, um, what's going to happen is this will also introduce the possibility of a little bit of a distortion of things kind of changing a little bit uh, over the course of the painting, and um, which is what would happen if we did if we just launched right in and started painting skin tones and things on here we'd also lose a little bit of the original um, the, the difference is is that in the way that I would normally approach this painting I have a lot of confidence in myself as a painter having been painting for so long to be able to find all of those lines but I think for some people who are just beginning um, it might be a little bit alarming to to find yourself looking at a painting that looks very impressionist when the goal is a little bit more uh, detail so you can see I'm kind I'm not doing everything here So, I love Bellows because his style, um, there's, there's a, I guess there's a bit of a cartoony aspect to his style, and I've always been really into comic books and cartoons. I'm currently working on a graphic novel right now that will be in stores probably in February of 2023 so when that's coming out don't worry <laughs> you won't be able to avoid it if you're if you're a subscriber to the channel there's a good reason to subscribe so you can hear about that when it as it gets closer to coming out and I'll share 
um, some images when my, assuming my publisher allows me to post all that stuff I, th I think they probably would be more than happy for the publicity but that's all stuff in the contract okay Uh, some of this is getting... I'm, as I go a little bit faster, sometimes I, I put a, a little bit of texture in here accidentally that I don't want. So, I just try to brush that away because sometimes that gets a little bit hard. To, it's hard to paint on, on thick texture. So I think probably another two or three minutes I'd like to be done all of this. Again, you can see, like, whoa, this looks pretty sloppy, Michael. I mean, I guess. If you want, you can spend a lot more time on this. This figure, by the way, on the left, is George Bellows himself. He inserted himself into the painting, so that, uh, which is, you know, typical. A lot of artists will sneak their, their themselves into, a, and that goes back to people like Leonardo and Michelangelo, and I mean, there's many people believe there's. You know, within the Sistine Chapel, that Michelangelo painted himself into it, and some people say that the Mona Lisa is actually a self-portrait of Leonardo in drag. I'm not kidding. People have written PhD theses about just that very same thing. So, I mean, there's some of these fellows on the bottom down here. In the original, their heads are cut right off. So, we're going to... We have the opportunity, if we want, to kind of include them in here. Here's the referee. What's kind of interesting with this painting is that, and maybe I'll just, uh, I'll put the, if you want to read a little bit about the painting while we're, I'm painting it, is that, uh, so this moment documents the famous incident in boxing history where Jack Dempsey who was uh, the heavyweight champion at the time, and is boxing this Argentinian boxer, um, where Jack Dempsey gets punched out of the ring and falls out of the ring into the arms of the spectators. Now, at the time, uh, Dempsey was was like a major celebrity. Again, he was the, the champion of the world, famous boxer. And he's an American. The, the fight's 
taking place in the United States, I'm pretty sure. I th I'm, and, I th and I think um, that uh, Hopper was there in person. I'm not sure if this was the angle that he was at. If he, I, I could be wrong. Now, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm not sure if he was actually there to witness this fight. But either way, um, what's interesting is here's Jack Dempsey being punched out of the of the ring. But in actuality, he ends up winning the fight. So he gets back into the ring and he ultimately wins the fight. So it's funny that that he chooses to present the eventual loser of the fight Furpo in this in and in, in this kind of very heroic pose in Dempsey being thrown out of the ring like I think probably most people if they were gonna make a painting about a, a famous boxing uh, boxer they would choose to paint their you know the exact opposite the moment that Dempsey wins the fight so the fact that um, let me see, I'm just gonna paint these as black lines right across here. thinking now I might actually paint these white now that I think about it I mean they will go white but uh, a lot of comments in here um, got that there what should we do next well I guess what I want to do is I want to paint my background the one thing is All of these ropes. I just want to. What I'm trying to think about is how to do this as fast as possible, because I want to paint the background in. And if I do that in in a way, like there's one way I could do is just very carefully paint around the ropes and the figures, and that would that'll work. It, it's going to take time, and I'm always thinking about like how can I do this as quickly as possible. And not only that, but I think it would look better if, for instance, I paint this whole background, all of this. You probably even paint over all these little figures in the background and just add them back. If I, mm, I guess I'll leave a little bit of it. Um, but if I paint all of all of that, then I can. I'll get a really nice even background and then I afterwards I can just paint the white lines and that will go like literally save me a lot of time so I just want to think about um, let me think okay I think I've got a solution to do this I'm not going to tape the painting off, but I'm making a little guide here. That the painting can sit inside of. Here's that 
post there. Okay, so this way, now later on, I mean, uh, uh, it's possible that these could be, you know, when I when they get obliterated, I don't have to worry. I'll be able to find them much easier. So let's move into painting this background. Now we do the lights on here. I could paint around these lights. I think it would just be easier just to fill this all in, just darken it up, and then to lighten it back up afterwards, I think. Yeah, it would definitely, I mean, I could, it, it could be done. I th yeah, let's just paint the whole thing, let's just darken it. So in fact, I'm just going to use my dark color. And maybe I will use black as as a out. See, if I use this, maybe that's just gonna be too dark. So I know I'm doing a lot of thinking out loud here, but uh, why not, right? So okay, I'm gonna add some more warm blue in here, just to kind of just so I don't have quite the dark, 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 dark background. It's going to be a little bit more of a slightly bluer, maybe even let's just take a bit of white, turn it into a bit more of a gray. And see how this reacts. Okay, so you can see why having some of these lines. I'm just going to paint over these figures in the background. I think I got enough on my plate to do all of this detail. So, So if I want, I can glaze these little figures, these people in the background in again afterwards. And it might actually kind of look cool because they'll just be sort of very, almost, we can make it so they're almost very smoky and barely visible back there, which is kind of how they are, right? They're just sort of um, barely. Well, I guess now they look at it, they're 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 more visible than I thought. But as I said, you know, we're this painting. Even the way that I wanted to approach it is still going to take me about four hours. So anything that's going to help me. 
maybe eliminate some detail here that it will just sort of I'm gonna be grateful for <laughs> So I'm painting like in all of these spaces here and I'm kind of clipping some of the heads a bit. It's not, it's kind of sloppy. That's okay. I just want it to be kind of even, which means it's also possible that I might do a second coat of this. You know, I should also say, like, I'm not a fan of boxing. I don't watch boxing. My, my, both of my grandfathers were boxing fans. Um, my maternal grandfather boxed a little bit in World War II as when he was in the, the Navy. Um, and, you know, I think boxing... The relationship to boxing is, is much different than it was at you know at this time period. Boxing was 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 very very popular at this time. You know in the nineteen twenties. You know um, it was just a, a major spectacle, and uh, it's now we have. Uh, MMA fighting is is very very popular. I don't I don't really like that at all. Um, but I can you know I understand everyone's free to like whatever they want to like. So already I feel pretty happy with I like that all of a sudden just darkening it down just starts to feel pretty intense. Um, what's great also is is the way that George Bellows by in the way that he made this painting, he decided to put the the horizon line down very low so that we are also right at the bottom, right? We're like a spectator, like all these other people here. You know, maybe Dempsey's going to fall into our laps as well. And I think that's so cool. Like, I think probably the majority of artists, if they were going to make this painting, would probably put us in the ring, right? And as if maybe we're the, the referee or something, or maybe at mid-level. But instead, he puts us, like, right into this smoky, dark room with the, the lights shining right in our face. And so it really feels like we are there. Now, Lolly says, I find it hard to watch boxing and some of the MMA stuff. It looks brutal. Yeah, I've never been, never been a big fan of, of that. Um... For, for that same reason. Okay, so I'm just thinking to myself, do I want to do another coat of this background color? When I look at the side by side, I do see like 
there is a little bit of transparency here. I think it would look probably pretty, it would look better if I did darken it. So I think I'm going to go to that next level. I may even, should I start doing darkening some of the clothing of the people in the foreground? Uh, good question. Let's, let's mix our, this dark color again. We're going to be using it a bunch of times. So let's just put the, some more red directly in there. I'll put some more blue in there, about half and half. Let's put some yellow in there. So right now it's got a bit of a more of a reddish brownish kind of color which just means we need to add a bunch more cool blue into here just to take it out of the brown realm and back into the dark realm and I think I also want to put a bit more now this I just mixed is much more um, just gray but remember we added some cool blue into it to make it just a little bit more a little bit more bluey of a room just to give that the, the darkness maybe a little bit more vitality I guess okay so I'm just going to blow dry this just to kind of speed up this process. Had to have a little bit of Christmas candy and I had to text my wife and ask her if she could make me some tea because I forgot um, to make a little bit of tea before I went on the air <laughs> and it's kind of chilly down here even though I'm wearing the um, new thermal underwear my wife got me for Christmas. And speak of the angel. That's okay. Thank you, love. Exactly what I needed. No, nope, that's great. Thanks, though. I just realized I forgot this little spot in here.
And when in doubt, I'd rather paint onto the figures uh, and then and have a little bit and then paint my foreground back over top of them than to not paint enough of this color. That way I can ensure a really nice, seamless, smooth um, background. All right, so now this background has got a really nice, solid, unified, like it's pitch black in here. We're going to lighten it up with a little bit of of uh, stadium lighting in here. pretty good and I think while I'm here I'm gonna do a little bit take this dark color and also put it on some of these figures in the foreground where it's really dark interesting that I thought this hand, this hand the way that he's painted it this looks like a thumb this makes more sense for it to be this guy's arm or right, this guy's arm did we just find a mistake in in this painting I think it's supposed to be this guy's arm so I'm actually I'm gonna make a little change here Now, our second coat of paint will just be something a little bit different than this, but... All right, and then if you remember, there was that little bit of the corner that I didn't like. Well, I've just painted over it and it's kind of disappeared. Now, it would have disappeared, I guess, no matter what corner it was in. All these corners are black, but... Anyway,
Let's back out. <laughs> and, uh... I'm just gonna consolidate all of this paint into one area. People are always asking, like, why? how do my paint stay wet for so long? One of it is probably I'm often in a very cold... My studio is quite cold, so that will slow the drying time down dramatically. Um, it is humid in here, so that's, you know, Vancouver is a pretty humid climate. It's, but uh, if there is paint that you want to preserve and that we might not return to this paint for another hour or two, I'm, just by sort of piling it up like that in one corner, means at least some of it is going to be preserved. If it's all kind of spread out and thin, then um, it's going to dry really fast, right? And maybe that sounds super obvious, but... just going over and I can see some of the texture of this paint catching highlights because and which is there's nothing necessarily wrong with that but if it's not if it's not in a place that I want it to be at then it could be really could create some really undesired effects of light hitting it in certain places and and got me a bunch of Earl Grey tea, which I love. The, uh, the Earl of Grey is also what the Grey Cup Canada's, the, the trophy given to the best Canadian football team every year, was named after the same person that the tea is named after. It's a fun little fact. Um, okay. I guess what I want to do probably would make most sense next would be to, to finish the background. Let's get some lights in here. It's going to be a bit of a... It's, that's going to take about 20 minutes to do, but I think those parts are, are important and they're going to elevate this painting. Because right now it's kind of cool. Um... Obviously, like if we just painted the, the 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 ropes and the figures, it would look really great. But it would feel like it's taking place. the The space itself would be undefined. Like, is it taking place in somebody's basement? Is it taking place in a giant warehouse or a stadium? In a, in a private gym somewhere? I don't know. The however. These big lights, these lights, these small lights on, make it appear that this is in a, like a big room, right? So uh, it gives volume to the space, which right now is undefined. So we're gonna mute the microphone.
Okay, so let's, uh, what color should we use for our glaze? Um, we look at the original, there's a bit of like yellow in these lights, which is not, uh, which is not surprising because lights at this time would have been very orangey and yellow. So, uh, you know, again, I could have just used the warm yellow of my canvas and we could have slowly blended between the light and the dark to get there. But I think um, just time-wise, this is going to go fairly, this will work just as well. So let's get some tools ready for this. We're going to need a brush for blending and we could use our mop brush if we wanted. We've got a big mop brush and right, a mop brush is great for blending. This is what a new mop brush looks like. Here's our used mop brush. Uh, and then we could just use a brush like this for also blending. Um, and I'm going to use a small brush like this to do most of the, the detail here. So, um, let's do it with cold yellow to keep it in the background. So I'll take some cold yellow. Let's take a little bit of white. And mix that together. And then we're going to take some matte glazing fluid, right? Or satin glazing liquid, same thing. Um, and we're going to, you can see we're putting a lot of it in here, probably like four to one. Because I want to keep this mixture relatively transparent to start. In fact, I'm going to mix that up. wipe my brush off. I'm not going to clean it, just wiping it off because there was a lot of the white and the yellow in here originally. Now I've just really got the glaze in here. By using a, the, the cool yellow for this, it's also going to help keep it a little bit further into the background. where the original lights were. So maybe we can start up here in this big area since this the we can kind of practice up here first. All right? And then you can kind of take your blending brush and just soften up those edges. very super subtle that's okay so I'm, I'm probably gonna expand that or well we'll see let me think about it let's go where do these lights are well they're kind of there's one let's get some of that excess off uh, here's the post there's one basically right above this post Let's just make these bigger. Right, that previous one, you can see it didn't last as well.
I guess we should try to keep these all about probably the same level here, right? So, subtle to start out with okay no point in trying to do anything more don't push it just leave it like that and then we're going to blow dry it and continue on Okay, as you know, I really like the matte glazing fluid because when it when it's dry, it's no longer shiny. So I can tell really quickly, oh, that's that's totally dry. Okay, that's ready to, to paint on a little bit more. Versus glossy glazing fluid can be kind of, sometimes you're like, is that wet or is that dry? I can't quite tell. kind of nice is that these lights start to kind of give the room a bit of a smoky quality already right just kind of that um, faded out kind of quality So you can see sometimes, like, if it's a little bit thin, right, I've got these little bands that I don't want, but I'm going to be able to fix all of that. It's just a bit of a pain, but that's okay. So let's uh, blow dry again. It just uh, requires a little bit of patience.
guys just keep on trucking. It's gonna fill in this area where there was that little banding. I guess it's <laughs> kind of maybe went a little bit far with these lights, but that's okay. So now I've got kind of my halos. I might just fix this a little bit, and then I'm going to start getting dark or more intense, but mostly more and more white as we get closer to the center of these lights. So this gives us this kind of cool glow of lights, and then we'll have the, the as they get closer to the heat of the lamp, they're going to get more and more white. Put a bit more glazing fluid in.
Blow dry before I try to fix. Blow dry, then fix. Okay, I just want to get a bit soft in that edge, so I'm just taking a bit more glazing fluid, like mostly glazing fluid, just a little bit of color. edge even harder. Okay, it just means I just gotta come back again.
So now I want to do this glazing, but I'm going to add more and more white until we get very close to like an actual bright white. It's hard glazing with white because it's sometimes very hard to see what is actually white and what is glaze. So that's why it's a good idea to kind of start a little bit small and then kind of build up. So this is where our white is going to be. Okay, just you just as soon as you gotta start it over again. Gotta blow dry that to get all that off. Now actually I noticed that there's sort of three lights up here. Almost like it's way too much glazing fluid. It's hard to gets into your brush and clogs it up. Unmute. I took me an extra second longer to unmute or to mute. Just start going down into here. Let's open this out. Now I'm, I've noticed that my blending brush has gotten a little bit of paint on it, so. Hmm, I'm gonna have to move those lights down.
try that. So these lights should probably be more down here. Every time I start fiddling with it before I blow dry, I always get spanked. I wonder how bright these lights should get. I just, I just looked at them side by side. I haven't really been looking too closely. The original, my lights are much bigger. <laughs> oh God. Uh. Okay. Well, what are you gonna do, right? <laughs> Thou shalt not fiddle. That's pretty funny. Um, okay. 
Let's, uh, I'm gonna blow dry it one more time, and then I'm, uh, maybe I'll... Almost done. I just want to clean up a little bit in here, and then we're going to put some white right into the centers of these. That's getting, or maybe a, that's enough, I think. So I'm just gonna take now just some pure white, maybe just dilute it a little bit. Let's get a bit more on the brush. Actually. Just sort of blotting it a bit. So I've pretty radically brightened up this scene. I 
I'm not sure what I was thinking, but uh, I don't mind it. It's just the different, right? Lolly asks, I wonder if you could use the uh, dark black color in a glaze to shape the lights if you aren't happy with them, or will that just undo the subtlety? I think they look okay, particularly the spotlights. Yes, absolutely. You can you can glaze with dark colors like that, and absolutely. You could, uh, it would instantly kind of fix maybe problems that you might have had. Like, you just have to be very careful, and I would probably use a lot of glaze and just a little bit of the dark color and let's say you know there's some of these areas like that are you know could use a little like you said I could shape them um, yeah but it's it's totally personal preference for sure I mean this is not my my finest work <laughs> By any means but let's say towards the end maybe I will decide to kind of just take a little bit of darker glaze and I could fade that up I could just touch this up a little bit I could narrow the the, the spotlights down from being these big um, uh, floodlights into spotlights right I could literally change the type of lights that are coming here very smart yes absolutely Uh, Paula says, it's so dark outside, I had to put the, uh, down the curtains. Glad we have light. You're always so positive, Paula. I love how positive you are. Yes, we are lucky to have light, aren't we? Okay, so let's clean these brushes. For all intents and purposes, I'm just going to move on from the background. I don't know if we need to spend much, any more time here. And any more time... You know, is uh, just considering how long we've been there. Is I mean, I, again, I would probably say George Bellows probably spent at least a couple of days. Now, he would be painting with oil paint, which would make all of this so much faster and easier. Um, but uh, because you can blend so much with oil paint. Um, it just goes so much easier. But with acrylics, it's a bit of a pain in the butt. So now let's start... Which we, should we do a flesh colors next? Now this is interesting. These flesh colors, he's all over the board with, with color. And, I, and that's a good thing, but it's just... Where should we... I mean, he's even got these yellows that we have down here basically in there. Just a little bit more, like you can see even the difference in the skin tones here. We've got, you know, some pinks and greens, browns and purples. Dempsey himself has got is much paler. We got this kind of elbow that is very uh, purpley and pink in the back of his neck. I wonder if there's a significance to that. Maybe in in the fight he hurt his elbow or something. I, I don't know. So I think what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to mix a um, a Caucasian flesh tone, a kind of a peachy color, and then we're going to modify it throughout the, the next little bit here. I'm going to make a bigger batch of it because we're going to use lots of it. So let's take... Get a bit more warm red. So we're going to take warm red. Mostly, that's, uh, that's, that's very orangey. I want it to be double the mixture here with the yellow. We want a much more yellow orange. I mean, there's places in this painting where he's, we've got that orange as it is in parts of the flesh. So, 
Uh, maybe I'm gonna I'll leave as I mix it. We'll have some of these colors kind of off to the side, and we can dip into the paintbrush and, and get that. Let's uh, let's take a little bit of cool blue. Let's put this off to the side here. Just mix a bit of that in there. I'm just going to just get a bit of that color off. I'm not going to completely dry that brush off, but nor will I wash it, but let's get some white in here. So just by adding white to it, we get a much lighter color, obviously. So now that's a color that is ap appears all over the place. We can darken it. We can add a little bit more blue, which will make it go even darker brown. Um, I mean, there are lots of colors in here. And this color is much ye more yellow. So we'll add a little bit more yellow as we get there. It's almost got a greenish kind of quality too, right? So, I think I'm going to apply this flesh tone as it is quite liberally all over the place. Um, everyone in this picture is Caucasian, uh, so that simplifies things a little bit just from a, you know adding color to these figures. So let's. Okay. So I'm just gonna take this. I'll go right up into the hair here. So this is why I painted some of those f facial features a little bit lighter. Or darker, I mean, so that I could see them when I get to this point. That's where the knee is.
little bit more white in there. Now I could probably, rather, rather than trying to just painting everyone's face this color, I could spend more time giving more nuance, mixing different colors for every face, and which would work great, it would look great, but time-wise it's just going to take me a, a while. So what I'm doing is I'm just trying to save myself as much time as possible by kind of painting everyone with the literally the same brush stroke. <laughs> um, here's Edward, or not Edward Hopper. Um, although they, I wonder if they ever met. They probably would have met Edward Hopper and Bellows. Well, Hopper was a bit more of a reclusive figure, so maybe, maybe not, but... if I'm going to spend time doing the the figures on the other side of the ring I'm going to leave them out for right now and if there's time at the end I'll come back to them just don't be surprised if this painting ends without any people on the other side of the ring Well, this is so much detail in this one. All those faces, I struggle a lot with realistic faces. Um, I can understand that. Uh, I would also say that, you know, th one of the things I like about the way that Bellows painted is his figures. He did do commissioned portraits for a little while once he, as he got more and more famous, but a lot of the, I mean, these faces, they're, I wouldn't, really consider them very realistic they're they're very almost cartoony so um, you'll see that as we paint this there's a lot of detail 
that is going to get left out, right? I'm just not going to spend hours painting each person's face. Right, I'm, we're, we're going to take a lot of liberties here in a few moments. So, um, I'm just trying to think, okay, again, time, speed-wise, etc., Let's get, let's make this a bit more of an orangey color. So that was our original one. This is the, oops. This is the, the, the new color. And, you know what, I'm going to put a bit of glue, uh, yeah, I'll put a bit of glazing fluid in here just to make it a bit more transparent. That way if I want to blend everything I can. Because he, this is more similar, I was about to kind of launch into a bit more of an impressionistic kind of approach to this, but um, it would be, that's a very different type of style than he's painting here, so. Here's a knee. I know those aren't exactly the right colors right now. I'm just sort of putting every, all these as placeholders, especially as it gets darker. Like this shoulder is probably going to come up, but again, we're just putting everything in places. forgot that leg. How did I miss that big leg there? the same color that's okay because all that's gonna it's gonna go a bit more yellowy anyway
mostly I'm just using this as a bit of a shadow. But I'm being very loose with the way that I paint it because I'm going to be using other colors in combination here. So I'm just kind of almost building up a little, uh, just some a strata of, of uh, of colors that, that can kind of show through other layers perhaps, especially if I use some glazing later. See, my mom in the comments says, Michael, Grandpa Cornell did boxing in the Navy. That's how he said he lost his sense of smell from being knocked about. Yes. Uh, I didn't mention that story, but I did mention it off the top that both of my grandparents were interested in boxing and that said grandfather was boxing in the Navy. Um, I forgot that that's how he lost his sense of smell. It didn't inhibit him from uh, enjoying donuts, however. Somehow, he still was able... You'd, th you'd think if you lost your sense of smell, you'd be like, well, you know what, I guess I could, I'll just eat kale every day because I can't tell them between kale and a donut, but he seemed to still... A little part of his, of his brain still was able, able to perceive the sweetness of, of the powdered donut and the tidbits and crullers the bear's paws um, okay let's just look at these side by side let's just let's just keep on going let's go to it let's modify this color uh, what where should we go with it? Should we go... Um, let's take a bit more red and, and go a little bit kind of pinkish. Take that color and let it get kind of pinky. You can decide how kind of wild you want to go with your colors. I'm probably going to stay within the the uh, where we are here but let's zoom back in
I mean, this is a lot of figures, so I am just speeding through here. My colors aren't super accurate. Probably I would run a little bit more of a cool pink in some of these places. I'm just like, whoa, man, if I really try to paint all of these correctly, quote unquote, I will, this painting could take me six or seven hours and I would like to be able to, to finish this painting by the time our daughter wakes up from her afternoon nap, so. Let's just take a look and just see before I move on from this color. Is there any use for this pink elsewhere in clothing or anything else? I don't think so, but it's just worth a little double check here. Okay, let's... Um, I think we might want to try to get... Actually, let's get, go for a bit of a brown before I go... Uh, too much further. Let's take a brown. Let's take the, the the warm blue from before that was just sitting there. here. It's going to be a different hair color, but... It's going to add a little bit of glazing fluid into my color here to a little bit more transparency, I think, is desired by me.
boxing gloves are kind of brown. This little fella here is kind of a weird space alien thing. I don't know what's going on there.
So, you know, all these faces look pretty weird and strange right now. And it's just because I'm just trying to... It's really, at this point, I'm still underpainting the whole painting. So I'm just trying to get basic things in place. Basic colors. Not even really the shape of, of things or worrying about portraits or all that. Um, okay. I think it might be a good idea to maybe... I do want to do more flesh tones and things. Uh, maybe let's do his this little bit more of a paler skin. So let's take a bit of uh, this warm blue and warm yellow and white. We've still got our orange, so we'll just take a bit of that. Now we'll mix some white into it. Let's get this different kind of value. Uh, maybe I'll even just use a slightly bigger brush here. Got a you know different color than the rest. It's almost a slightly dead color. You know, it's kind of it's not. It's a little bit sickly. And it's interesting that again, the guy who's falling out of the ring is the is ultimately the one who wins this match. So why? He decided to, because usually you would think that someone would make this kind of a portrait a little bit more of a heroic kind of thing, but he chose instead to paint the the moment where this player is knocked out of the, the boxer is knocked right out of the ring. We're going to take the same color and we're going to put it in the as a bit of a highlight on his body as well.
I do think maybe a bit of this color is intended to be kind of the the lights that are used here, which can you know can give a bit of a sickly quality to people. The stadium lighting isn't really the most flattering kind of lighting. it mixed a little bit more blue into this color and again it's got a bit that little bit of a greenish hue to it Take a bit of my cool red now. Mix this in here. So that cool red's gonna has a little bit of a different kind of quality than the the previous pink that we used here. It's it's a little bit um, it's it's cooler, so it's. It uh, is often appearing kind of in some of the shadowy areas of some of these faces. This kind of uh, um, cold pink 
has a real fleshy kind of um, quality to it. Like it, it uh, which seems really appropriate for this kind of like a boxing match, like these. Two guys just pounding each other blow by blow until the first one collapses on the mat. Okay, let's just take a look. Oops. So I think probably next I'm gonna paint um, some of the clothes because it's a little bit maybe confusing seeing all of this warm yellow in places where it doesn't actually exist. So let's, uh, oops, this brush needs to be clean. Warm blue, cool red. Almost have a bit of that purple in on this elbow. Let's maybe a little bit more pink.
about... Let's do... Well, I got some red on here. I think this is kind of like a combination of both reds. Take a bit of this purple in here. Actually, let's just try this. going to get significantly darker later. Mm. Let's just take a bit more warm blue, mix this into here. I don't know really what's going on here, so I'm just going to paint that in real quick. Very deep purple. We can, we're going to be glazing and darkening everything later on. So, this guy's mustard jacket. Take our warm yellow. Let's get some of our dark color. more green than I'd hoped. So we'll fix that as we get closer. I guess we should, let's do, take this brown that we use, let's put this in here just quickly for boxing gloves. Got it. I'm just gonna some of this hair that needs to be a little bit more brown. Let's just oh, this guy's pants could be almost another bit of. Uh, white. Okay, moving right along, let's get uh, this blue here, a bit of a 
more. Do I have any cold blue left? No. Pants. All right, they really pop right now, but we will tone it down. This guy's shirt down here. Not as many collars as I thought would be. Here. Okay. And then let's get the. I guess there's a table that's kind of got a bit of a greenish quality. Let's take some more white. It's got a bit of gray. We'll just make a gray with this here. It's a little darker than I was hoping. So maybe I'll just paint it darker and then we can lighten it up.
just made that uh, the mat a little bit high and I just did the same over here darker gray here. This is still that color. Remember we mixed at the very beginning. It's on the background. get into the boxer's hair just a little bit. Boots. I'm putting all this gray in here because that way I've got sort of a, a middle value between black and white. And I can always, I'm just going to maybe hopefully save me a little bit of time from when I start painting all 
this stuff black eventually. So let me just take a second here to have a sip of tea and just look, because we're, you know, we're three hours into the painting, and at this point, this is where I would say if you wanted to switch to oil paint, <laughs> this is where we finally got into that stage, and there's certainly more to come, but we've got the all of the basics in place. And it took us a while to get here. I knew this was going to be one of the longer paintings, but um, now I could start refining a little bit. So... This is this post. corner post It definitely makes a huge difference. Once all that yellow is gone, all of a sudden the painting sort of feels to take like a leap forward. We're like, oh, okay, it's coming into focus. Cool. Post is a little crooked. I do start to worry about if I want to widen it, I gotta bring this. Let's widen it a bit. This means it's going to get bigger. I might just leave it like that. It's pretty, pretty good. Okay. Um, so let me just clean up a few of these brushes. Yeah, well, I'd like to be done with the next. 45 minutes. I don't know if that's probably not going to happen, but Okay. Let me just think to myself. Um the best strategy to, to go on from here. That's...
So I guess I'm th what I want to do is I want to clean. There's a lot of edges that are pretty rough. I think what I want to do is do highlight edges and... I'm going to do my highlights to start, and then I might do some uh, darker edges, and then I'll glaze everything in between, which is going to mean that I'm we're going to have a lot of more similar colors, but just bearing in mind the time restraint for trying to get a painting this complicated done in a reasonable amount of time means there's going to obviously going to be lots of sacrifices here. Okay, so let's take our... I'm, I guess I'm starting with <laughs> the shadowy area. Okay, so I'm just taking a dark color, not my black. Let's just go into a few... So I just take... there's a little bit of white on this gray. So I don't want to just start going right into the darkest color I have. And I'm just going to shape Here I'm just going to simplify. Oh, there's all these, all this kind of stuff underneath the, the mat. I'm just going to let's just make it one simple color here. If I want, as I glaze, maybe I'll solidify that or add a little bit more structure underneath there. But time being. take my a fairly dark color it's I haven't washed my brush so I am it's 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 a very dark gray Maybe I should be zooming in for all this little fiddle work here. Paul says, will you use a, a pen or 
a, a brush for all of the ropes. They look a little bit difficult. Good question. I have <laughs> haven't quite thought that far, Paula. That's a great question. Um, you know, I I haven't even looked at them closely enough. I'd prefer to do it with paint if I can get away with it, but uh, by the time I'm, I'm at that stage of the painting, it's probably it's quite likely that I might be like, yeah, okay, let's just. I'm done. Let's go. ropes So this is a this is pretty close to black this color that I'm putting in Dempsey's hair here it's got a little bit of gray in it so it, it kind of pops a bit from the background
Uh, Molly says maybe when it dries you could use tape to do the lines. Yeah, that I think that you know that could work. The thing is, is that that might be a weirdly um, they, they they might really stand out as being a really different kind of texture from the the rest of the the painting so it's a, it's a you know pretty smart idea i just i'm a leery about i mean i you could use tape to to help with to help get the straight line I and mean, i might use that i might show you how i would do that but um actually using it like to get a a super sharp line might be too much. We'll see. So I know I'm just zipping back and forth around the painting because I'm sort of mixing slightly different colors and darkening things as I go.
Okay. I was talking about food there. interesting so I'm going to take this a blue and a purple mix in some of my dark color intense. I should be doing that as a glaze, but So I think, uh, speaking of which, I'm, I am going to glaze with this dark purple here. So it's, it's cool red, warm blue, as well as my dark color that was made up of warm yellow, warm red, cool blue, and cool uh, yellow.
So I know the original doesn't have kind of outlining quite like this, but uh, I'm just... Uh, up against the ropes so um, now just like Dempsey here I'm gonna pull a victory out. I'm gonna have to come back from the from being knocked out of the ring, right? to be widened. Do I have any more of that paint anywhere? I was wondering where the other part, other shoe was. Okay. So I'll come back and darken everything again, or just keep, gonna just keep motoring around the painting with this glazing fluid.
One thing I need to do is get some more smaller brushes because they have all kind of, I use them a lot and they've worn away. So, go back to the well where I've, I've bought them before, which I think I was Michael's. Putting this purple onto this kind of greenish color it complements it pretty well. Like purple being the opposite of of, of uh, I'm not the exact opposite, but fairly close to the opposite of green makes it uh, a really nice color to put in uh, to the shadows. Still just using this my purple here. Just gonna, uh, yeah, let's continue using some purple on these pants, maybe. here shortly instead.
just before, let's get this guy's hand in here. <laughs> this, what have I, this is some pretty weird stuff going on in this over here. Let's get this green tie on on the ref in place. We take some cold blue and warm blue and warm, cool yellow. Also seems to kind of work well as a I think I could glaze with this color so that's just cool yellow cool blue and warm blue let's put a bit of glazing fluid here
back over here. Okay, I'm taking this green, which I've been painting with for just a few minutes now. Glazing foot's getting a little opaque. See how kind of nicely like the green and purple kind of complement each other, especially like in the shadowy areas. It just it gives the sense that there's lots of different kinds of light, and um, there's going to be all sorts of reflected light, of course.
just noticed this guy's got like a uh, striped shirt. I don't think that's going to be making it to my painting. at it for a while, zoomed out. Okay. Looks like this wasn't quite dry yet, so I'm darker brown in here.
Where else does this brown go? Interesting. Let's see what's going on here with the Okay. That was weird. There's some bizarreness happening. Let's just see if the audio is still okay. things let's put some highlights back I've been doing a lot of darkening So let's get a, f I think I need to mix a new flesh tone, Caucasian flesh tone here. Uh, let's take some yellow. Let's take some red. In fact, let's do this over here. Yo, 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 Okay. So what were some places, as I've been painting, I was like, wow, that needs a little bit of a... So let's zoom in so you just can see how I'm adding, like, so you can see how it's pretty choppy in a, in a number of places here. Actually, this all highlights, that's all highlights. Uh, oh, this guy's nose down here, this was...
let's do a lot more white. is you make it look easy it's just practice um, the more you do the better you get it's just like anything else in life and you just have to be willing to put a little bit of time in, into it and And be able to accept the inevitable disappointments. It's painting is 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 disappointing often, right? And you just have to learn to kind of to to be able to to move on from the frustrating moments and know that there's better days ahead you know the same sort of thing with like I don't know what would be fishing you know like not every fisherman catches a fish every time they go out but that doesn't mean they're just like, well, I guess I tried fishing. Doesn't work for me. Clearly, I, I'll never catch anything. I mean, maybe there's probably people who do say that. <laughs> um, These highlights are maybe a little intense, but This guy's got quite the pointy nose. We'll come back to him.
I was just thinking, like, I, in the background, there's a guy holding his hat up in the air and cheering. When the inevitably those, like, if people, when they threw their hats up into the air, were they try to find their hats? Or would they just be like, eh, I guess that's it. The hat is gone forever. I mean, I guess it's like when people throw the hats onto the ice at hockey games for um, for a hat trick. I guess technically you, you can try to get your hat back, but often they, some places will just give them away to charity. And Lolly says, um, paint, boxing is a good metaphor for painting. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely great metaphor for painting. I just needed a bit more of a shape to these pants. I guess we could probably put a bit of this
see that he made that actually go a little bit more greenish than I did. up and running again. Cool yellow, cool blue, and warm blue together. Mixed with this time a bit of white. I take a bunch of white, mix it in here, take a bit of my gray. Painting the mat a little bit again. I'm kind of just using a bunch of random colors, honestly. Just to, well, not random, not totally random, but just trying to get, um, like once I've got a color mixed, I'm putting it all over the place. Because part of what he's doing is he's getting colors to, layering lots of different colors to get this effect of um, these multicolored shadows, which I think is really cool, really, really cool part of his paintings. Okay, so as I get pretty close, I gotta do the ropes and I want to finish off with, I wanna do some darker glazing in here. Okay. 
have to mix my dark color again. I'm just sort of putting in a bunch of whatever's left over here. So there's warm yellow, or sorry, cool yellow, cool blue, a bit of warm red, a bunch of different colors made it into that mixture. So I just want to use this as a way of adding a little bit of a final darkening agent into this painting. That's a little bit purpley. Back to gray. So we put a lot more glazing fluid in here. Okay, there it's behaving again. Definitely the, yeah, I have forgotten to do the boot. Good idea, thank you. Both of us have got that boot weird. How does that... Okay, so I'm taking my glazing fluid here.
also. I've been letting these paintbrushes just sit there drying with paint on them. Not sure how I let that happen.
Just sort of darkening everybody down a little bit. Okay, I think I've got to put some um, uh, the ropes on here. Oh my goodness. I don't think I've nailed that green.
But, uh... Boot feels better now, Lolly. You can go to sleep. <laughs> um... Okay, so let's get some ropes. Uh, actually, no, wait, right before I do that, let's just... Put a little glaze on this post. blow dry that just well let's see if I can get it even not bad okay I still want to blow dry all of this anyway because I'm going to put on the ropes now and I think that's going to change the painting quite dramatically so it's a big missing element Okay, these ropes. <laughs> um, okay. Let's 
So it might be worth, now that I can put my ropes wherever I want them to be. up with my lines it matches up pretty good with my lines so it tells me they're pretty straight is going on. Not sure how to get rid of that. I put a pencil line here where technically that's where it's supposed to go, but because of the way I've drawn things or painted things, it doesn't seem quite right. So I don't think the eraser will work. I could try glazing. Let's see. 
I've never tried erasing a pencil mark. No, it's not going to erase very well. We'll see how that dries. But, what are you gonna do? Actually, I will put that... Okay, uh, I think it is in the exact right place and I just needlessly tried to... This is what happens when I get tired and hungry. Bit of a mind warp, some of this stuff. That goes in front of that leg. It's not clear. <laughs> I appreciate your uh, encouragement, Lolly. Okay, so let's go. I'm going to take a bit of. Let's make a bigger batch of this. I could use a Posca pen, but I just think it's going to be so... The thing with the Posca pen is I only have one gray, and I kind of want to modulate this color a little bit, and not just have it all one, uh, one gray, so... I'm gonna start, I'm gonna hand paint it. Let's get, make a bigger batch, that way it stays a little bit wet for a little bit longer. Maybe I'll do the ropes on the side here first.
Boy, oh boy. I mean, I knew this one would be a tricky one.
<laughs> You're very supportive. I appreciate that, Lolly. Um. Okay. What happened there? Oh, that's the pencil line. So now let's take some white and we're just going to brighten up, tint this gray a little bit more, create a little bit of a lighter tone. Okay, actually we should blow dry that so I don't smudge it.
Oh, volume's off. My apologies. I guess that was quite a while it's been off, hey? <laughs> Heidi says to take a break and go have dinner. Um, well, that would mean I'd have to go help make dinner. <laughs> I know, I just unmuted it. Thanks, love. Goodness. Surprised that it all came off without wrecking the background. I'm just going to continue on and wait for that area to dry.
don't worry, guys. I I appreciate your your comments, but I'm I'm doing very fine. <laughs> Almost done. Okay. I mean, there's little details like all of the little knots in the in the ropes, but I think I need to get going here. So, I'm going to call it a day.
Okay. <laughs> Provided you lots of entertainment there, Paula. You got uh, lots of lots of painting in. I can't wait to see how many paintings you managed to make in this period of time. Thanks for watching those of you, Heidi and Lolly, all the way through. That's so cool to see people who've paid attention for so long. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Maybe it's, I'll just actually, let's just see these two side by side here. It's been a while. Blow dryer. <laughs> this is kind of sealed the tape onto the... It's just a little, it's a, um, there's little issues and problems I have it with, as I do with every single painting, but considering how complex this painting is, every time I see lots of figures like this, I know, okay, that's gonna, gonna be a, a time-consuming painting, but all in all, I think it turned out pretty good. Okay, thanks everyone for watching. If you like the uh, what you see, like, subscribe, and you can see another five and a half hour long episode. Uh, on uh, Tuesday, we're going to be celebrating Kwanzaa, so tune in for that, and um, we're getting ready for the new year. So there's, I'm going to be restarting the entire Intro to Painting course, so that if you're... If you find this a little bit complex, don't worry. We're going to start right from the ground zero and build everyone back up. Uh, and eventually you'll be able to go back and take tackle a painting like this. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your holidays. And we will see you again in just a couple of days. So eat up all of those cookies and crackers that, have been, that are around the house and get ready to get in shape in January. <laughs> Okay, everyone, enjoy the rest of your evening, and we will talk to you again very, very soon. Have a great, great night. Thank you so much.